Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna. This is episode 31, and this show is, as always, sponsored by Loserport.com, a fantastic new betting game you can get involved with. Stay tuned until the very end of this podcast for more information. On this week's pod, we'll be reflecting on the 3-1 win over Leicester City or the Mesut Ozil show, depending on what you want to call it. Joining me a little bit later on in the show are Chris Davison and Mike Stavrou. So after Monday night's victory, it's safe to say that I'm a very, very happy gooner at the moment. I mean, I know we've been winning in the Premier League ever since that defeat at Stamford Bridge back in August but for me there was something extra special about Monday night's performance and I'll expand on that point a little bit later on for starters I love a Monday night football I think it's the worst day of the week and it's much easier to get through it when you have a game under the lights to look forward to now prior to the match I received a few inbox messages from various people asking me to predict predict the lineup and in truth, I really, really struggled, thought about it for ages, took my time and, and still ended up getting it completely fucking wrong. Um, after any international break, I guess there are loads of factors that you've got to take into account as a manager. The number of minutes the players played, the distance they've traveled, conditioning. And of course, there are those who return with knocks, bumps or bruises. And I guess judgments can't really be made until the club get the players back and can make their own assessments. I must admit, I wondered whether Torreira would start given that Uruguay had taken on both Japan and South Korea during the international break. And then I wondered whether Unai Emery would stick with that sort of 4-4-2 formation that served him so well at Craven Cottage just a week, uh, a week ago or two weeks ago now. Licksteiner came in at left back. Uh, we'd heard that Nacho, Monreal and Kolasinac both had slight injury doubts and the boss opted not to take the risk with either. Iwobi started, Mesut Ozil returned as predicted. Mikitarian got the nod, but Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang was left out. Um, I want to get the negatives out of the way first, so, so here goes. And I think the first point is that those of you who have been calling for Licksteiner to start every week ahead of Bellerin in the politest way possible need your fucking heads tested. Um, I know he was playing on the wrong side on Monday night, but based on what we saw, he clearly doesn't have the legs anymore to get up and down as required in this uh, Unai Emery system. I think he lacks quality in possession, uh, the quality that Monreal and Kolasinac boast, and therefore our attacks down that left-hand side until he was withdrawn lacked any fluency whatsoever. Again, reiterating the point that I know he was playing on his wrong side, but I'm not talking about the fact he had to cut in here. I'm talking about the fact that he just looked unfit, he looked tired, he looked out of his depth, and as though the game was, was passing him by. I think watching Licksteiner last night makes you realise just how much work Hector Bayering gets through and, and what an asset he is to this team. I mean, I don't want to dig the Swiss international out too much because I do think he has a positive influence, particularly in the dressing room, but he couldn't even defend last night. You know, simple as that. Holding was constantly being pulled out wide in order to cover the ground. He, he just wasn't making up. Um you know, it's just, I don't think he can play at that top level from the start based on what we saw last night. Call it harsh, but, but that's my opinion. Now, Leicester actually went close even before they opened the scoring through a Harry Maguire header, which was saved brilliantly by Burned Leno. And I remember standing there, you know, in the North Bank and screaming at why Harry Maguire was allowed to stand at the far post and, and was being marked by. I think it was Bellerin, if my memory serves me correctly. And that's just a complete mismatch. You're asking for trouble. If the fans can see it, why can't the players see it? I know zonal marking is a thing these days, and it's something we're seeing more and more often. But for me, 
it's just a complete mismatch and we were asking for trouble fortunately Bern Leno made the save and, and averted the danger but we got away with that no doubt about that um Leicester probably feel that they should have had a penalty as well I feel they should have had a penalty if I'm being completely honest I called it at the time straight away you know Holding's arm was up in an unnatural position not where it should have been yes there's an argument he was fouled before that but for me that's a stonewall penalty I can't believe the referee's not given it but what I will say is those of you who are really against VAR and are completely you know against the whole concept I think the, the fact that you've taken that stance means that you don't have a right to to question it you know you don't have a right to question referees decisions because they will make mistakes and particularly when they don't have a video to refer to that, that's the nature of the game these days it's basically impossible to referee a game accurately without that aid and, and until people accept that we're going to continue to see these types of, of things um occurring even at the top level even in the premier league uh the atmosphere at the emirates on, on monday night was noticeably better uh than it has been in recent seasons i don't think anybody can question that i was really impressed by it a friend of mine who came with me to the game who doesn't go to the emirates often even commented on it um the last time he came was was during the wenger era so he noticed that too uh, you know, when we went a goal down, there was there was more encouragement from the fans. There was a a sense of we need to lift the team and get behind them and and get ourselves back in the game, as opposed to that moaning and groaning that had become synonymous with the Arsene Wenger era. Having said that, though, there were a few supporters that were a bit disappointed in Hector Bellerin uh, for the Chilwell goal because. It seemed as though Chilwell just had that little yard of pace. But what I will say is he started his run deeper. And, and when a left back is coming at full pelt and you're, you're starting on your toes and or on your heels, I should say, maybe, you're naturally he's going to beat you for pace. He's got the momentum in his run. And Bellerin was unlucky there, you know. Nine times out of ten, Chilwell plays that ball, hits Bellerin and goes out for a corner. So really unfortunate there. And he certainly made up for it with two brilliant assists. Um particularly the first one for Ozil, which I thought was a really, really accurate pass. And, and one thing Bellerin has developed since Unai Emery's arrived, he seems to be picking out passes more now uh, when he's in those positions as opposed to just smashing it across the penalty area. He looks far more composed and, and the strikers are reaping the reward for it. Um, so a good performance from Hector Bellerin overall, I thought, um, last night, well, Monday night, I should say, pretty much epitomizes all the good that he brings to this team. Alex Iwobi is another one who's improved the tenfold since Emery's arrived. He looks confident. He's powerful. He's skillful. He's got all the attributes to be a really, really good player. I felt he was mismanaged a little bit last season. Um, Emery's obviously gone in and put his arm around him and, and made him feel important. And he's seen the benefits of that. And he's got a massive part to play in our season. Um, Mesut Ozil was the captain last night unquestionably the man of the match in my opinion some people will argue Alex Iwobi deserved it um, I've even read some people saying that Lucas Torreira deserved it I won't go that far I can understand the Iwobi argument but not really the Torreira one to be honest although he did have a good game I thought most had a good game yesterday but yeah Mesut Ozil captain and that's a call I've made before I recall saying it on a podcast last season that I felt that giving him that armband that extra responsibility would see the best out of him um, because he is a player that that needs to be loved he's a player that needs confidence and he thrives on it and giving him that extra responsibility yesterday seemed to spur him on and you know not all good captains are shouters good captains can be those players that lead by example as well and, and that's something that people often forget um, there's a sort of stereotype that a captain needs to be in your face needs to be screaming well that's not the case um, that is an old school mentality and, and the game's moved on from that so you know if he continues to perform in that vein and lead by example then I've got no issue with him holding on to the armband um, and just lastly, before I uh, bring the guests on, I want to talk about Granit Xhaka because he was asked to move into left back. Um, a really bold decision by Emery, one that paid off. And we know Granit Xhaka is, is anything but a left back, but I thought he filled that role really, really well. He just he 
put up and done a job for the team and the team ultimately were rewarded for it. Um, I think I'm going to start calling him Xhaka Carlos from now on or Granite Carlos, um, seen as he's such a competent left back these days. Right, I'm going to take a short break and when I return, I'm going to get some guests on. Enjoying what you've heard so far? If so, make sure you hit that subscribe button and leave us a review on iTunes. Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, Mr. Chris Davison. How are you, my friend? I'm good. Thanks, Harry. How are you? Not too bad, man. It's been a while. It's been a while. How have your travels been? I saw you were in the States for a quite a long period of time, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. For a month, um, uh, went over to America um, with family. Um, uh, went from New York to LA. So, uh, yeah, uh, one one trip of a lifetime. Um, thankful I had the opportunity to do it. Um, but yeah, it's been a great experience. And um, whilst I was out there, Arsenal were on a very good run. I'm back, and I'm glad to say the run is still continuing. Um, we're still on a good run. Ten wins in a row, obviously, after the game last night. Yeah, that's right. And it, what a fantastic, at least second half performance it was last night. What were your overall thoughts on the game? I was a little worried at half time. Um, actually, maybe not at half time, maybe just prior to that. Um, I think once we equalized, things looked a bit better. But in the, uh, particularly that first 30, 35 minutes, it was concerning, wasn't it? But it turned out well. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean, Harry. It was, it was concerning. I was, I was um, like you said, um, sort of first 10, 15, 20 minutes, um, uh, Leicester looked dangerous going forward. Obviously, they got that, that goal, um, fortunate deflection off Bellerin. But they, they were always looking dangerous going forward. Um, and um, it, it could have been one or two more, uh, especially with um, the let off from the, the, the potential penalty that could have been um, from the, after the handball from her holding. So we were fortunate in that respect. But um, like you said, you know, just before half time, we got that goal that sort of got us back on track um, and helped us a little bit. But second half was much better. We were we were the better team. Um, we were the ones looking dangerous. Um, and some of the football we played last night was exceptional, um, top top class stuff. Um, and uh, that's you know that's the Arsenal we all know. You know, I've been saying on Twitter, I'm saying to to friends, you know, ten ten wins in a row is is fantastic. Um, but not only that, we're seeing the football that we would usually associate with Arsenal Football Club. We're seeing some top, top stuff. Um, the players seem hungry to win. Uh, the confidence around the squad at the minute is, you know, um, is there, um, that which obviously hasn't been before. Um, and just the focus, you know, and um, everyone just seems happy at the moment, you know. And uh, I heard I heard the atmosphere at the Emirates last night and it sounded the, the, the best it had been in, in a while, actually. That Even, you know, when we went 1-0 down, the fans started singing, getting behind the team. And that's what we've been missing, you know, because the fans are as important, um, or as important, sorry, as, as anyone. Let's not forget that. And so it's, it's been refreshing. This whole this whole change and this this 10 ten win row um this winning streak is is just lovely and refreshing to see and um long may it continue yeah sure and it's brought the fans together i can tell you that there was definitely less definitely. moaning and groaning yeah. last night and more supporting and i can confirm that that was definitely the case and a friend of mine who who came with me last night who doesn't usually get to many arsenal games he's he's normally uh, watching them from home but he, he did notice it you know and he that was the mm. first thing he mentioned sort of 10-15 minutes into the game he said there's noticeably a better atmosphere here tonight and and you know that's Definitely. that's that's great and it's encouraging to see um, what have you made of well I mean there's no point in talking about Mesut Ozil we know what he can do but what <laughs> have you made of Alex Iwobi's improvement under Unai Emery well, it's, it's quite fascinating to be fair, Harry, um, to see to see the player he's 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 turned into um, in recent weeks, um, or since the season started. Really, I mean, you've probably seen and and heard that I've I've been a, a critic of Alex Awobi before. I've, I just didn't think he was good enough. Um, every single week, he just had no confidence, um, and I just I didn't see what he was offering to the team. Um, I just simply did not think he, he was good enough at the moment because I know he's obviously still young, and I, I've often said alone may have may have done him done him some good. Um, but you know what? We're, we're seeing what he's really capable of now. It seems like Emery's given him a hell of a lot of confidence, um, and he's a totally different player. Um, it, I remember one of his, his best bits last night was the the touch to bring it down, and then he nutmegged one of the Leicester players, and 
Um, it's not the first time he's done that in recent. I think he done it the, the other week as well. You know, he's just looking like a totally different player. And I really hope he can continue this form. Um, it's the same with Bellerin as well. And there's, there's a few players in this squad now, Harry, that I wasn't so sure about, but they are improving. And it's, it's you know, quite um, clear to see. And I think Bellerin again last night, assist assist master, just as, uh, just yeah. as much as uh, Zul's been, you know. And I think he was brilliant. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a lot of positives coming out of this squad at the moment. And um, you, just, you just hope you've got to keep your fingers crossed that it continues. Yes, yeah, certainly, certainly. Now, taking all of that into consideration, we take on Sporting Lisbon on Thursday evening in the Europa League. What's your prediction for that, Chris? Because our preview show is going to come out a bit later, um, you know, because we focus on the Premier League games on those. So we won't be doing a Sporting Lisbon preview show. But, you know, we'd love to have your prediction on this one. Um, I think... I think it's going to be a tough game, um, and uh, I think uh, you know if you would look look back a season or two ago with Sport and Lisbon, they've had they've had a very good team, but um, obviously in recent times uh, they've struggled off the pitch. I think there was a, a training ground incident with the fans, and then that led to a lot of their decent players leaving. So um, you know we've got to fancy our chances, especially with the good form we're in as well. Um, but it won't be a tough place to go. Um, it won't be a tough tough team to face. Um, it will be a tough team to face. Sorry. And, um, so you know, I think we'll I think we'll get a win, and I hope we get a win. Um, but I think it'll be quite a close game. I think it will be. It won't be easy going. Yeah, I'd agree. I'd, I'd definitely say that's the toughest game in our Europa League group. Chris, thank you very much for joining me. Do you want to quickly remind our listeners of how they can follow you on Twitter? Because it has been a while since you've been on. Yeah, yeah, it has um, yeah. I'll just uh, my uh, my username's uh, C Davison underscore AFC, and I'm I'm trying to you know post as as much as I can. Um, I'm hopefully if I get the time, uh, going to do some more interviews with people as well um, about uh, our season so far um, and, and stuff like that. Um, recently started a new job as well, so it's it's been a bit difficult to find the time for it. But hopefully, um, I'll get back on track soon and catch up with some work. Great stuff. Great stuff. Chris, thank you once again. And we'll be speaking to you again very, very soon. Cheers, Harry. All the best. Thank you. The Chronicles of Aguna 2017-18 is now on sale. The Chronicles of Aguna tells the story of Arsene's final season through a supporter's eyes, attempts to shed light on some of the season's major talking points and features exclusive interviews with Ray Parler, Kevin Campbell, Tom Watt and Robbie Lyle. Available to order now from Amazon, Waterstones and all major bookstores, The Chronicles of Aguna 2017-18. Order your copy now by clicking the link in the description. Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, Mr. Mike Stavrou. How are you, my friend? It's been a little while, hasn't it? I'm very, I'm very well, Harry. I'm very well. I've just come back from a long weekend in Barcelona where I actually went to, to the camp now and, uh, and watched Lionel Messi play for about 15 minutes. And then, uh, <laughs> then he got stopped. On, How's your luck? Which is How's your luck? <laughs> I know, but to be fair, he, he like, assisted with his first touch and he scored. So I can't complain too much. I'm a happy boy. Yeah, he's he's fantastic to watch in the flesh, isn't he? And you know, even if he has torn us apart a few times, but you know, <laughs> we'll get over it, I guess. Um, Mike, Arsenal versus Leicester City. Um, not the greatest start from our boys, but in the end, some scintillating football, and we won our tenth straight game. What did you make of the overall performance? Yeah, I mean, can we just start playing how we do in the second half from the the first whistle? Because I don't, I don't understand it. Like as soon as we go into half time, the, I, I don't know what Emery juice. I, I don't know, but they come out and they're so fast out of the blocks. I mean, I think p- a part of it in the first half, the kind of slow tempo was just them feeling that their way into it. And Leicester were good, to be fair. But second half, we came out and absolutely blitzed it. Mess Ozil on. Oh my word! Like I think that one of the best individual performances I've seen from him. I'm thinking back to maybe that game against Zagreb he had in the Europa League a couple of years ago, where he was unbelievable. And obviously, people have been saying about the three 0 against United, but he absolutely run ran the show. And for 350k a week, these are the top performances we need from him, Harry, consistently. Yeah, that's right. I thought he was absolutely brilliant last night. You know, um, 
really took the game by the scruff of the neck. I've mentioned already that I think giving him the captain's armband gave him a bit of a kick up the ass. Um, you know, a bit of extra responsibility, showing him a bit of love. And, and with some players, that, that's what they need. And, and maybe Mesut Ozil is one of those players. Um, your mate, Granit Xhaka, ended up playing at left back in the second <laughs> half. I mean, what was going through your head when you, you realised that, that Granit Xhaka had been moved to left back? Yeah, I couldn't really believe what I was seeing, to be honest, Harry. I think the, the reason was because the, I, I think Emery wanted a bit of balance because Lichsteiner was playing there and he wanted to come inside on his right every single time and it was it was really leaving us in the lurch. So I think Emery put him there as a kind of short-term solution, but it wasn't actually that bad, to be fair. So And I'm I'm always the first to, to criticise Xhaka, but I do yeah, think... Yeah, we know. <laughs> yeah, I know, but... Um, I do think that Torreira coming in to the side as the deepest line midfielder has really like allowed Xhaka to to shine, and yeah. we can we're, we're getting the best out of him now because he's he's not the last man, which means he doesn't need to make these rash decisions and he doesn't need to pick the ball up off the centre half or or the keeper. He, he can actually do what he's good at, which is you know which is passing in more advanced positions. So I'm happy with him. I can't complain. Yeah, you mentioned there that you know why can't we start games the way we're finishing them at the moment and I agree with you it's, it's a problem um, and at the moment we're getting away with it but you you can see this becoming an issue later on particularly when you play against the stronger sides you know Liverpool's coming up in a couple of weeks time they're a side that notoriously start games very well what do you put it down to though do you think it's a tactical thing do you think that we're just slow starters is it that we're taking time to settle into games. I mean, what, what is it in your, in your eyes? I think it's happened way too often for it to be coincidental. I yeah. think Emery said to them um, that if you go into half time with a, with a draw, then, you know, we're, we're a lot more secure. Cause I think he probably looked at a lot of the games that we had on Darcy Menga, the big games where we would get blitzed in the first 10, 20 minutes. I remember games against Liverpool, like within 20 minutes, we were three nil down. And I think he's he's kind of looked at that and said, let's start off solidly and kind of build our way into the games. But the, the issue is teams like Leicester won't punish us, but teams like you said, Liverpool coming up in a few weeks will punish us. So we need to be able to go into these games and start fast and put ourselves ahead because as well as we've been doing so, so well, and I'm so happy with our play, like it's like total football at times, you know, the, the passing and movement, we need to, we need to do that consistently and from from the get go, because it's going to be much more difficult. And even even this week, like we've got a double header against uh, Sporting, we've got Palace on Sunday, then we've got Liverpool next week. The games are coming thick and fast, and we need to be able to start quickly in all of them. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I don't disagree with any of that. I think um, I agree with you. I don't think it's coincidental. I also don't think it's tactical because I don't think that any manager would set his stall out to to be slow in the first half, to be sluggish, to concede as many chances as we do. Um, you know, I, I personally think that maybe Unai Emery's fitness training uh, has got us being able to last longer in games, and that's why maybe we're looking better than our opponents, particularly in the latter stages. I don't know if that's got anything to do with it, just a hunch of mine. Um, but yeah, you know, things things are, are looking positive. The results are, are going well at the moment. Turning our attention to Thursday, obviously we travel out to Lisbon to meet Sporting. Um, the, the preview show this week will be out after the Sporting Lisbon game because we'll be looking ahead to the Crystal Palace game. So, Mike, how do you see that one going and, and do you expect wholesale changes in terms of the lineup? Uh Yeah, I do, Harry. I think it's going to be... Uh not the easiest game because Sporting a good side they had a lot of issues in the summer with um, with they got rid of a lot of players like their main players uh, Patricio Martins all of these who would have caused us problems um, so I don't think it will be it will be easy because they still do have a good side I think he will make wholesale changes if he has to um, I think Aubameyang might might play because he was he was uh, on the bench you know came on after 60 minutes um, but I think he will have to rotate the squad. What is a bit worrying is that um, on the bench for yesterday's game against Leicester, we only had one defender and he was youngster. The, yeah. the names, I, I can't remember his name, but um, it really does show we do have a lack of depth in that in that position, especially if Socrates is, is not quite right 
Uh, Monterey, I think, was, I'm not sure what was going on with him, but he was rested, which when Lichstein played left back. So I do think in January, that's going to be a position that we have to strengthen in purely, not, not even just going out and signing like an incredible centre back, but someone who, who can just add to the squad depth for a bit. Yeah, I don't disagree. It was Medley on the bench yesterday, um, inexperienced. And, you know, the rumours around Nacho Monreal uh, are that he uh, had a bit of a tight hamstring. And so Emery opted not to risk him. Same with Kolasinac, um, had a, a potential problem. So the manager chose not to, to take that risk. But you, you're absolutely right. You know, we're a bit short in those areas. Um, and you know we're down to the bare bones at the moment and I know Callum Chambers is not having a great time at um, out in uh, at down at Fulham sorry but you know it's just another we don't defender, want him back, isn't it? it's another body though isn't it that we, we just don't have at the moment so you know I think no. in January th- th- maybe they'll be looking to offload Aaron Ramsey if possible get some money in and just get a couple more additions in there to, to tighten things up a little bit what do you think? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I agree. I, I definitely don't want Callum Chambers back. That's, I'm, I'm glad <laughs> we we kind of got rid of him. But I just, I just wanted to make a point about the, the kind of rotation we've been seeing. Like all these all these players, young English players, going out to to foreign leagues and doing really well. I, it is it is a bit disappointing that we have no place in the squad for someone like Reese Nelson because he he scored another two goals for Hoffenheim on the weekend. He looks. He looks incredible, and I would have liked to see him here. But you know, as long as he's progressing and he's doing well, I'm happy for him. But one player that I do think has been dramatically improved is Alex Awobi, and yes. it showed over the last about three, four games. The guy just looks like a totally different player. I made the point on Twitter yesterday that uh, last year under Wenger, I think we had a we had an FA Cup or League Cup game, and the night before he was uh, pictured on Snapchat having a party. And his kind of reward was to start the next the next day, like in, in God knows what state he was in. I don't know what what went on at that party. I, I wasn't there, but um, that's the kind of difference in mentality between Emery and Wenger. It seemed like the players were a lot more relaxed. And Emery, I think he's given them a bit of an ultimatum and said, "Look, if you don't perform, you're not going to play." Like look at Ozil at the beginning of the season. He was he was subbed at half at, um, at half time because he wasn't good enough. And I think that's the difference, Harry, now between between them two. The players have that competitive edge, which I love to see. I'm so excited to see it again. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, when you have a, a squad that are all involved, as you said, like, you know, the likes of, you know, Aaron Ramsey will probably start on Thursday night. Um, you know, and, and Aubameyang, like you mentioned, Danny Welbeck's there as well. He's in with a shout as well. So there's always players waiting in the wings now, isn't there, to come in and, and fill gaps. And you just get the impression that people are playing to their top level because, like you said, if if they don't perform, they're out of the side. And so, you know, it's it's a good environment to have. It's a good problem to have, I guess, as a manager. Um, but then also, you know, it it poses a lot of questions before each game and and I've said at the top of this show that I find it very difficult to predict Unai Emery starting lineups um, and I guess that's a good thing because it, I'm sure the opponents have the same problem yeah I want to ask you a question as well yeah, sure. Harry do you think we are kind of getting a bit ahead of ourselves in terms of the, the I know it's this 10 wins in a row seven in the league do you, do you think we are getting ahead of ourselves in terms of the opposition that we've faced and how would you predict a game like against Liverpool coming up? Do you think we'll be able to cope defensively? Do you think we'll be able to take the game to them? And do, would it be like, would it be having to outscore them? How could you see like a game like that going? It's really difficult to say because my thing with Liverpool is that I've always said that they're very fast starters. And if you can contain them for the first 20, 25 minutes, particularly when they're playing at Anfield, you've normally got a chance after that. Now, that's something we've not been able to do in recent seasons. Liverpool have always started strongly against us, particularly last season at the Emirates. I know it finished 3-3 in the end, but they did. They go 2-0 up, didn't they? So uh, it's a difficult one because, like you said, you know we've got a bit of a problem. We're starting games too slowly, and I fear that if we do start the game too slowly against Liverpool, we could find ourselves out of it. And coming back against Leicester or coming back against West Ham is a totally different proposition. No disrespect to those clubs, but they're not title challengers. They're not teams that people feel can go all the way this year, like Liverpool could maybe. 
So, yeah, I'm a little bit worried about that. Um, but I'm, what I would say is we'll probably learn more about Arsenal in that one game than we have over the last 10 or so. Um, so I'm really interested to see how yeah. it pans out and, you know, and what team Emery goes with, who he thinks will be best suited to face Liverpool. You know, I, this selection after the the uh, international break, it's a bit of a difficult one because I think as a manager, you need to take into account minutes travel, uh, minutes played, distance traveled, and there's lots of factors. And so I don't think this lineup was necessarily what he wanted to go with. I think obviously we know yeah. Nacho had a problem. We know Kolasinac had a problem, uh, but I think th- all that stuff comes into, into the equation. It'll be interesting, you know, We've got a, a game on Thursday and then Palace on Sunday. Let's keep going. Let's keep the momentum up and, you know, we'll take it from there. But yeah, Liverpool will learn a lot about this Arsenal team. Yeah. Do you think that he knows what his best starting eleven is? Because I know that it's good to, to, to keep chopping and changing in terms of competition. But when we do come up against the, the big size, I think we do really need to nail down what exactly our best eleven are in, in or you know, does it? Does he think I'll kind of I'll change it based on that opposition? It, the thing is, he seems like a very pragmatic manager. He seems very tactically aware. We've seen him make changes during games, haven't we? Which is something we were critical of Wenger for not doing in the past. So, what yeah. I will say is, I guess there's a theory that you'd like to see the same eleven play week in week out. But I think what Emery's done well is he's kept everyone involved and everyone's included and everyone feels like part of the project. And as a result of that, you can change the team. Um, you know, it's not like he's played a set 11 every week. Everybody's on their toes. Everybody's ready to play when called upon. So I'm not overly concerned about that at the moment. I'm not worried that he hasn't got a set 11. And you know what? I, I see it from a positive perspective where I, I actually like seeing our manager select the team that he feels is best equipped to win that particular fixture. So, you know, yeah, I'm, which, I'm is okay that, that, which is something that we didn't have on Wenger, of course. He kind of went with the same team and kind of shoehorned that team into into every fixture. And it's nice to see something different. You know, Harry, I'm just happy to see us playing good, flowing football. I mean, that that third goal, Aubameyang's goal, you know, and it's not even like, it's just out of the blue. We, we scored... Um, a similar one against against Fulham and this is like on a consistent basis which means that you know what's happening in training is translating onto the pitch and these kind of fast moving counter attacks is something that they're doing and then replicating again and again and it's just so good to see it because I haven't seen Arsenal play like this in a long time probably yeah. about five six years look, looking back thinking about the kind of teams that we had when we played this style and I think everything is just quicker and you know, under Wenger, it did get quite slow and stale, and it was very sideways. And I think, especially the the introduction of Torreira, who's always looking to pass forward, and you know, as he, he receives the ball in the half turn and he passes out, you know, I think it's made such a big difference. And personally, I I'm not bothered if we don't necessarily challenge for the title this year. I just want to see us playing good football again and getting back into the Champions League and just building from there. Absolutely, absolutely, and and that's what it's all about, isn't it? And you know, I think w- when you're talking about those goals, like th- obviously the one uh, against Leicester City and the one against Fulham, I think you can see the confidence in the players. You know, the the one touch flicks, the the dummies, the step o- stepping over the ball, letting it run, and knowing where your teammate's going to be. That all comes from confidence. And what I'm trying to say is, you probably wouldn't see such levels of confidence had we not been on this run so you know I think the goals are a product yeah. of of the results if that makes sense but yeah yeah, that, yeah. All right. lovely Mike You're right. yeah you. I do I'm, I, I'm I do sorry Don. go ahead no I was just going to say I, I do think it is a confidence thing because you wouldn't see the the players taking them risks if, if they didn't believe in what the manager was telling them or Absolutely. believe in their teammates to get on on the end of it and just even like Mesut Ozil's finish for for, for, the, for the equaliser yesterday just so nonchalant like the guy he just kind of let it hit his foot and he was running away and celebrating even before it hit the back of the net and that's the kind of style and uh, that I love to see us play yeah no completely agree absolutely fantastic to watch and and yeah long may it continue i guess uh mike thank you so much for joining me i'm glad to have you back on the show once again do you want to quickly let our listeners know or remind them how they can follow you on social media 
Yeah, of course. So I'm on Twitter. It's uh, at Mike underscore Stabber and you can find me on there. Lovely. And do follow him. Do follow him. He's all right when he's not slating Granite Xhaka or Granite Carlos, <laughs> I'm going to call him after last night's performance. <laughs> Granite Carlos. Love it. <laughs> Cheers, mate. That brings us to the end of episode 31. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget this show is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Acast, FNX, and of course, TuneIn Radio. We are sponsored by Loserpool.com, a fantastic new betting game that you and your friends will absolutely love. Check them out, Loserpool.com. And we'll be back on Friday morning with a Crystal Palace preview show. Until then, ciao.